Welcome to the National Press Theatre. Bonjour et bienvenue au Théâtre National de la Presse. Avec nous aujourd'hui, Michel Rampel et Pierre Poilievre. They're going to address the immigration file. Um, we'll start with the about five, ten minutes uh, remarks, and then we'll go to uh, questions. Madame Rampel. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the tragedy that occurred on the Danforth this week, thank Toronto area first responders for their heroism, and express our support for the victims and their families. Canada's former Conservative government oversaw and supported the highest levels of planned immigration in recent Canadian history. Canada's Conservatives continue to strongly support a balanced, fair and compassionate asylum process in Canada. However, the reality is, is that Justin Trudeau has failed on all of these fronts. Frankly, I believe that the Prime Minister has ruined what was once a fair, orderly system that focused on both protecting the world's most vulnerable and aiding their integration into Canada's social and economic fabric. This is because since January 2017, 30, 000, over 30,000 individuals have illegally crossed the border from the United States into Canada and subsequently claimed asylum in our country. This dramatic increase in numbers occurred after the Prime Minister tweeted hashtag welcome to Canada in response to an executive order made by the American government. To reiterate, over 30,000 people have illegally entered Canada and then claimed asylum after already having reached the safety of the United States of America. By this government's own admission, many of these people do not have valid asylum claims and will eventually be found to have no legal reason to be in Canada. This high level of unplanned immigration has created strain on provincial social welfare programs and integration supports. It has also directed hundreds of millions of dollars of unbudgeted resources and support that could have been used to expedite those languishing in UN refugee camps, those seeking to have their family members reunited with them in Canada, or Canadians in need, to people who are in the United States of America. Further, by failing to close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement, Justin Trudeau has chosen to make this his new permanent immigration policy. He has constructed permanent structures at Roxham Road, built tent cities, and set up a permanent system of busing people to homeless shelters across the country. He has allocated resources to expedite work permits, health care, and social welfare payments for this cohort. In short, Justin Trudeau has no intention of restoring the system back to fairness and compassion. What's worse, he has done so without any plan to budget or pay for the costs of this decision. His failure to manage Canada's border is an urgent matter of public interest and Canadians are demanding action. While 70% of Canadians don't believe the Trudeau Liberals have any plan at all to address this crisis on our border, all the Prime Minister has been able to do is shuffle his cabinet and throw money at the problem. But this isn't a solution because money is not a plan. We have a situation where those waiting in desperate situations abroad, displaced from their homes in refugee camps, must sit and wait even longer while the Trudeau Liberals spend money on those illegally crossing the border from the United States. Canadians have prided ourselves on our ability to help those in greatest needs, those who face dire threats to their lives in their home countries. We've always been able to extend a hand to those facing persecution who need our protection. The Prime Minister's mess is damaging our capacity to help those who need it. And it's these innocent people who are already in peril who pay the price. In recent days, Justin Trudeau and his ministers have been using the language of fear and division to attempt to silence criticism of his failed approach to this issue. Canadians and newcomers to Canada alike have the right to understand how Trudeau will support the long-term integration of the influx of illegal border crossers in the context of a huge deficit budget, increased taxes, while millions of refugees languish in UNHCR camps. Today, my Conservative colleagues and I will be demanding some answers from this government. The questions we will be asking are perfectly legitimate and Canadians are demanding answers to them. We expect to see a plan from Justin Trudeau's government, especially given that over 800 people face eviction notices in Toronto's college dormitories in a little over a week's time. Canadians have waited long enough. It's time for Justin Trudeau to fix this mess. Thank you and we will take questions after my colleague Pierre Polyev makes a statement in French. <coughs> Merci beaucoup et tout d'abord, euh, j'aimerais saluer les policiers et d'autres euh, premiers répandants pour le travail qu'ils ont fait hier euh, pendant la tragédie à Toronto. 
Nos pensées sont avec des victimes, des blessés et leurs familles. Et nous allons être là pour, leur, pour les appuyer. Finalement, nous condamnons euh, les, euh, les attaques euh, d'hier euh, comme une, euh, une, une attaque contre l'humanité euh, et euh, nous allons euh, suivre, euh, et, euh, suivre les faits lorsqu'ils deviennent disp disponibles. Les conservateurs du Canada soutiennent un processus d'octroi d'asile équilibré, juste et compatissant au Canada. Justin Trudeau échoue sur cette question. Ce premier ministre a miné ce qui a été auparavant un système juste et ordonné, axé sur la protection des plus vulnérables du monde et leur intégration au Canada. Parce que depuis janvier 2017, 30 000 personnes ont traversé illégalement la frontière entre les États-Unis et le Canada. Puis, fait une demande, qui, qui, ils ont fait une demande d'asile au pays. Cette augmentation drastique est euh, sur, euh, survenue après le premier, ça a écrit « Bienvenue au Canada » sur le Twitter. De la propre admission de ce gouvernement, nombre de ces personnes n'ont pas de demande d'asile valide et finiront par n'avoir aucune raison légale d'être au Canada. Ce taux élevé d'immigration non planifié crée une, une pression sur les programmes provinciaux d'aide sociale et de soutien. De plus, il requiert des centaines de millions de dollars de ressources et de soutien imprévus qui auraient pu être utilisés pour accueillir ceux qui languissent dans des camps de réfugiés de l'ONU. Ceux qui veulent réunir les membres de leur famille au Canada et les Canadiens dans le besoin pour des gens qui se trouvent aux États-Unis et plus précisément à l'État de New York. En ne comblant pas la lacune dans l'entente sur des tiers euh, pays sûrs, Justin Trudeau fait de cela sa nouvelle politique d'immigration qui va devenir permanente. Il fait construire des structures permanentes au chemin de Roxham bâtir des cités de tente et créer un système permanent d'accumulation des gens dans des, dans des, euh, des refuges pour sans-abri partout au pays. Il alloue des ressources pour accélérer l'émission de permis de travail, pour faire des paiements pour des soins de santé et l'aide sociale pour cette courante. Bref, Justin Trudeau n'a pas l'intention de rétablir un système juste et compatissant. Puis encore, il le fait sans aucun plan pour financer les coûts de cette décision. Cet échec à gérer, c est, c est cet échec à gérer les frontières du Canada est une, est une question d'intérêt public urgente. Et les Canadiens et Canadiennes veulent que le gouvernement agisse. Nous, comme opposition, avons non seulement le droit, mais le devoir de poser de sérieuses questions là-dessus. Et nous, nous, nous n'allons pas euh, se taire, nous taire pour, euh, à cause de, des, euh, des attaques de division et de peur que Justin Trudeau et son cabinet utilisent. Alors que 70 des Canadiens ne pensent pas que les libéraux et de, de Justin Trudeau ont un plan pour gérer la crise à la frontière, tout ce que Justin Trudeau trouve à faire est de ramener, remanier son cabinet et de gaspiller de l'argent pour ce problème. Chaque fois que quelqu'un critique ses, son approche, il essaie d'utiliser des méthodes de peur et de division afin de, de, de leur faire taire. taire. Mais ce n'est pas une solution. L'argent n'est pas un plan. Nous sommes au point où les, des gens qui sont dans des situations désespérées à l'étranger, déplacés de leur maison vers des camps de réfugiés, doivent attendre encore plus longtemps pendant que les libéraux de Justin Trudeau dépensent de l'argent pour ceux qui traversent la frontière illégalement en provenance de l'État de New York et du Dakota du Nord. Les Canadiens et les Canadiennes sont fiers de notre capacité à aider les gens dans le besoin, ceux qui font face à de graves menaces pour leur vie dans leur pays d'origine. Nous avons toujours du, euh, pu 
tendre la main à ceux qui subissent la persécution qui ont besoin de notre protection. Mais les dommages causés par Justin Trudeau minent notre capacité d'aider ceux qui en ont besoin. Et ce sont ces innocents déjà en péril qui en paient le prix. Aujourd'hui, mes collègues conservateurs et moi allons exiger des réponses. Nous attendons un plan des ministres Justin Trudeau, surtout alors que plus de 800 personnes ont reçu des avis d'expulsion des deux trois universitaires de Toronto en l'espace d'une semaine. Les Canadiens ont, ont assez attendu. Il est temps que, le, que Justin Trudeau répare les dommages que lui a causés. Merci beaucoup. So we have uh, 20 minutes for questions. Uh, Glenn McGregor, CTV. Uh, Ms. Rempel, we're back to this uh, basic point. What is the solution? I mean, this, the Safe Third Country Agreement seems to have the government boxed in that they uh, are concerned about offending that agreement if they start deporting people who cross the border um, irregularly back to the United States. What? <laughs> If, if the Americans won't renegotiate the agreement, what do you do? Well, our, uh, the Conservative Party has suggested a number of legislative options that we believe that Canada could undertake uh, within its own purview to see the safe third country agreement apply to the entire length of the border. The, the, the unfortunate reality is that how long has this been going on for now? 18 months? And this is not something that the government has brought up in, in a committee study, in, in, in the House of Commons. Uh, the, the reality is that the government has not examined, and I, I assert that the government has not examined all options to, to enforce the agreement. Um, and certainly, I, they, there's no indication that they've even asked the Americans if they're willing to renegotiate it. So a lot of what you know we're talking about here in, in terms of some of the things you brought up is speculation because we don't know, because they haven't done it yet. And to me, that, that's very irresponsible. But there's another side to the coin here as well. Uh, the reality is, as you know, both myself and my colleague mentioned today, over 30,000 people have entered the country via this method. And now we have to talk about what we're doing because they're people, right? Like these aren't just numbers. And, and that's often with this government, what I've noticed is there's another side of the equation that is that often gets forgotten, and that is people's lives. So, you know, I, I'm thinking this morning about somebody who has entered the country via this method, who is not going to have their asylum claim heard for years, and is sitting in a dormitory in Toronto facing an August 9th eviction notice with no plan. Uh, you know, I, I'm very, I, I'm bemused by the fact that the government has been colloquially referring to uh, a system, a, a, an organized system of putting people on buses from homeless shelter to hotel to homeless shelter to rank as a triage system. Uh, you know, how, how are we going to process their claims? How are we going to support um, social subsidized housing? How are we going to, uh, you know, support social programs? These are all questions that require a plan and a cost. And, and I think where a lot of Canadians are asking uh, for this plan, it's because out of compassion and it's also because uh, the reality is, is that when you're, you're expending resources on people and prioritizing people who are entering the country via this particular method, there is an impact. There's an opportunity cost. There's an impact on people who are languishing in, in, in UNHCR camps. There are, there's an impact on people who are trying to process their applications to enter the country legally. And uh, we don't have a plan. So, you know, today I think the first step is, is holding the government to account to produce a tangible plan. Both, to me, I think to restore order to the asylum system. You know, the one thing that the government has said is they've asserted that the safe third country agreement still apply. So if it still applies, logic dictates that it should apply to the entire border. We, I need to understand if they have any intention of doing that. And if they don't, then we need to understand what the projections are for the number of people who will be entering Canada via this method and how the government plans to budget and pay for processing, for housing, for social uh, welfare programs. And then, of course, per, per Justin Trudeau's own minister's admission, eventual removal orders for those that don't have valid asylum claims. You referred to the government uh, using the language of fear and division to quash criticism, uh, I guess directed at you. Did, yeah. you. Could you kind of expand on what you meant then? Um, look, I, I, for, the, for the last two years, uh, I have 
served as the official opposition shadow minister for citizenship and immigration. And in the last two years, the, the question of the global migrant crisis, I think, has been one of the top public policy concern for any legislator around the world. You know, we see we see the uh, uh, European Union struggling to uh, renegotiate it, its own internal equivalent of the Safe Third Country Agreement. Uh, you know, I visited Uganda this year and, and visited some refugee camps there. I've advocated for the people in the Yazidi genocide. There, there are people it on the move in the entire world. And we are now in a situation globally where we actually have to ask ourselves how we respond to this issue. And that is not a diff that is not a, you know, it, it, it's not a conversation that is resolved in, in a photo opportunity, right? Because we actually as a country have to ask what is our capacity to resettle humanitarian immigrants in the context of providing long-term integration support. I don't think it's fair to say, okay, well, we're bringing people into the country and, and our plan for them is to shuttle them from a homeless shelter to a homeless shelter. They, there's no hope for integration there. And to me, that actually is detrimental to the health and well-being being of somebody entering Canada. It's not just about bringing somebody here. It's about ensuring that they have opportunities for success. And in order to do that, you have to have a planned orderly system because it costs a lot of money in the context of Canada. Canada, which has generous social programs to do this. Uh, which brings us to a more difficult conversation, which is how do we prioritize who comes into our country, who gets priority access, especially in the context of humanitarian immigration. We had a debate, you know, ab about 18 months around the Yazidi genocide, where we saw no Yazidi genocide survivors included in the government's resettlement plan. So we, we said, look, th these people can't go home. They have suffered extreme trauma. They should be on the top of our resettlement list. But they're not. Why? And and so to me, I think, you know, going back to your original question, I don't think that the government wants to have this discussion, Glenn, because it means going beyond a photo opportunity, and it means answering some really difficult questions that might be off-brand for this prime minister. And. To me, it's easier for them to say that, uh, to, to label me or my party uh, with something that I, I mean, I think anybody would make a hard press, it would be hard pressed to make a case uh, for us on that. Um, but that aside, it's not about me, it's not about the party, it's about doing right by people that are entering Canada and doing right by the world's most vulnerable. So I just think it's very damaging when, when, that, when, when those words are used to essentially silence debate on how. We can disagree on how. We can, have, we can disagree on the safe third country agreement or whatnot, but we can't not have the debate. We have to have it. And this is where I think a lot of Canadians are starting to question if immigration as opposed to how. And to me, that's what's dangerous. So, you know, today uh, we are going to be asking a lot of questions on the government that they should be able to answer if they are committed to a planned, orderly, and compassionate immigration system. And, you know, what I hope for people who are watching today is that, first of all, I actually genuinely hope we get some answers, because then we can start building towards a plan. I'm not hopeful, um, but if we don't get this right, and if we keep allowing, you know, the debate to, to go into labels, um, I, I, I genuinely am concerned for the integrity and capacity of Canada's immigration system long term. Did you say that they, they referred to you with some label that has discredited your criticism of them or an attempt Look, to discredit them? I, what I, did they say? I, I'm, I'm not here to repeat or to get into a debate on, on, on labels. I am just saying that I find it unacceptable uh, that the government does not have a plan to this date. And, and it feels like they're just kicking and screaming uh, to do anything other than that. And, and really, like, I mean, again, this, this is, there's a very tangible example that we have to deal with, and that is there are 800 people that we don't know where they're going to go in just a little over a week's time. Where are they going to go? I don't know. I don't know how much that costs. You know, we have we have gover we are outside of the budgetary cycle. Uh, this government keeps announcing millions of dollars, but don't attach any details to it, and that's not responsible government. What is responsible is my colleague and I asking common sense questions about projections, priorities, and planning, so that we can ensure that Canadians have faith in the integrity and compassion of our system, but also that people, when they do come to Canada, you know, have some hope of integration.
rather than just being relegated to a bus. Uh, Janice Dixon, uh, Canadian Press. Uh, Ms. Rempel, I just want to pick up on Glenn's question on, on this issue of fear and division because it, it came up last week uh, when the Prime Minister shuffled his cabinet and he made a comment, um, not to quote him directly, but said something to the effect of the Conservatives will stoke fear on this issue. When you're asking a lot of questions that have more to do with logistics than anything else, how? what's your strategy, because it'll likely come up today, um, to kind of, you know, hammer your point home that you want to plan and that this isn't about um, division? Canada's Conservatives will not apologize for asking, I think, pretty basic questions about the maintenance and operation of Canada's immigration system. And not just intake, but long-term integration. And that's, I think, something that has been forgotten in this whole conversation. Uh, there's been so much conversation about how many people do we take in, rather than how do we support people when we're here. And we're starting to see you know, the consequences of that lack of planning. I, I mean, regardless of who's in power in Ontario or in Quebec, the reality is, is that we, are, we have tens of thousands of people that we don't know where they're going to go, and we don't know how they're going to integrate into Canada, and they likely don't have valid asylum claims. You know, I've heard nothing from this government on reforming Canada's immigration programs set to refl reflect the reality of economic migration. You know, I've seen this government increase the temporary foreign worker program, for example. It, is that the right choice? There's so many interrelated issues here, but like, I mean, right now, today, I, I, like, there are people that are going to be evicted out of college dormitories. Um, the government has announced tens of millions of dollars uh, outside of the budgetary cycle with no details on where that's going to go or um, projections. I, I will, just as an aside, our, our party did ask the P parliamentary budget officer, my colleague Larry McGuire did, to, to, to undertake an analysis on projections. Uh, the par parliamentary budget officer has asked both the Minister of Immigration and Public Safety uh, by Thursday to provide uh, a lot of projections. Um, so, so if, if you know if the ministers aren't able to answer some of these questions today, I, I'm keen to see what they submit to our, our officers in, who's in charge of scrutinizing budgetary expenses. But I just I don't think it's acceptable for us to be, you know, the province's strategy to have to be to, you know, ramp up um, uh, requests for money every every couple of weeks because they have no idea how many people are crossing the border or where they're going to go. So that's really been our focus. Um, to me, I, I think that, the, I will say this, the government has made a permanent and significant policy change when it comes to immigration because by not seeking to enforce the safe third country agreement across the entire border, they have rendered it moot. Like, let's be honest, right? So now, because of that, uh, we are seeing the results. We are seeing a lot of people enter Canada and, 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 and significantly jam up the, the asylum process and the asylum system because of this. So how is the government going to account for this policy change? And to me, that's a pretty, that's a pretty reasonable question. Are you expecting to learn anything new today? Um, I guess, I, I guess I, I'm less hopeful than I was before the cabinet shuffle because I actually don't understand how this new ministry works. I don't, like, I mean, the CBSA and the RCMP do not report into this new minister. Um, citizenship, I, I actually don't understand who outside of the minister's staff and driver reports to him. So is this a... Is this a PR exercise? Is this just going to create more bureaucracy? Has, has the Prime Minister intent to make this, this ministry permanent because this has been a policy change? I, I mean, now, we're now at the point where I, I'm not even sure who to ask questions, right? And I, I think, you know, you would probably echo my, 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 my curiosity on that. So uh, I think that the government has a lot of explaining to do, but again, we are doing our jobs as uh, parliamentarians and, and if the official opposition and saying, look, uh, you need to have a plan, and uh, that's really where this debate needs to go. 
and a démarré uh, in politics. You've mentioned a few things already about what the, cons what the Conservatives might have done, like extending the STCA to the whole border. What else would the Conservatives do if elected next year to kind of fix, in your words, this the immigration system that uh, the Prime Minister has brought in? Sure, and I mean, I, I'm just reiterating points that we've already made. I think the, the primary uh, focus, policy focus, needs to be uh, reducing the demand on the system by people who likely will not have valid asylum claims. So, of course, the STCA. Um, I think over time, uh, we, we probably have to, Canada has to have a, play a broader role in some of the discussions that are having internationally on asylum system reform. Um, I, I think that uh, we probably also need to look at our economic immigration streams and, and ask if there aren't better ways for us to uh, welcome people to Canada through permanent uh, residency streams that aren't taking up capacity in our asylum system. I think we have to, you know, I, I would say something we've in, tried to reiterate over and over again is that our integration programming should be managing towards, uh, towards integration rather than entitlement. You know, we want to make sure that we we have programs in place that are uh, supplying labor to parts of the country where they're in high demand, but people often don't resettle, uh, and that we're encouraging people and enabling them to work and to be productive members of, of the Canadian economy over time. And when we are intaking uh, humanitarian Im immigrants, that we're budgeting for the fact that many people are coming from, you know, I'm thinking about the Yazidi cohort, right? Many of these women have severe trauma. Uh, they, they are going to need integration support over time and we need to have adequate budgetary measures so because there's a cost to that we should be prioritizing victims of genocide we should be prioritizing the private sponsorship refugee stream uh, you know the government has placed caps on that program uh, so uh, you know to me there's there's so many things that a conservative government would do differently to prioritize the world's most vulnerable I, I do I will say this uh, the 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 backlog of cases at the immigration refugee board deeply concerns me um, and I, I think the government's approach to date has been to create a permanent bureaucracy that assumes you know high levels of cases that likely won't again by their own admission have 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 valid claims and I would rather clear the backlog on a more temporary basis uh, and then restore our asylum and humanitarian immigration system to the priority cases like you know, um, we, we just made a call for prioritization of LGBTQ refugees from around the world. Um, and I think we're now at the point, and many other, that many other countries are, where we're asking who, 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 do we, who do we prioritize? And we've had that debate kind of offline in different contexts, like with the Yazidi genocide. Uh, you know, there are other cases of internally displaced persons. I'm thinking of Afghani Sikhs and Hindus, the Rohingya people, that often don't aren't reflected in Canada's immigration policies and those those people are just we're not even talking about that right now so I think that we would bring the discussion back to that and I think Canadians in doing so would have confidence in the integrity of the system I think the problem is that people are looking at somebody being on a bus in upstate New York and crossing into Canada and saying I am fleeing from persecution and I think that that is a tough thing for a lot of Canadians to comprehend and to bounce off of Janice's question, what does the creation of that new ministry tell you about the Trudeau government's priorities? Interesting. Um, I think that it, uh, the first thing I thought when I heard that, I, I thought two things. Uh, public relations exercise one, because I think, uh, you know, the, uh, Trudeau, is, it, it, Trudeau is admitting that Goodale and Hussein have not been stellar performers on this file. Uh, but what's interesting is that he didn't shuffle them out, he just created a ministry. But the second thing was permanence, right? So he has now said, this is a permanent situation and there's a minister for it but I you know I guess the third point would be confusion I, I don't understand how this operationalizes and and, I, and to me when you think about the situation that's happening at Roxham Road the last thing that we need is confusion we need more clarity and I think we just need people to step up and do their jobs I, I mean in, in Justin Trudeau's minister's defense I will say that they need to make a decision on the safe third country agreement either it is in force or it's not uh, and, and, and this rendering it moot and deciding not to talk about it, I think, has exacerbated the situation. And uh, look, it's, uh, 
make it, to quote someone famous, it's not easy to make priorities. Um, and uh, in this case, we have to make priorities because uh, otherwise I think we're doing a disservice to a lot of people who are trying to enter Canada who are legitimately fleeing persecution and to Canadian taxpayers. Yeah, go ahead. You both mentioned the Danforth shooting uh, at the beginning of your remarks. The mayor of Toronto has said he can't see a reason why somebody would have a handgun in Toronto. Do you think there's a role for the federal government in trying to curb the rising gun violence in cities like Ottawa, Mr. Palmer? Um, well uh, or um, in, in Toronto, should there be something done on, on sure. g gun regulation at this point? Um, uh, first of all, I'll start by sh sharing concern for what happened. I mean, Canadians should feel safe. Um, I think it's a bit early to, and probably irresponsible to speculate on what happened until the Toronto law enforcement community finishes their investigation and we understand the context uh, with, with a bit more clarity. Uh, but just in terms of uh, the whole criminal justice situation, gang violence, uh, gun violence, I have watched the government's response, this government's response to increased crime rates across the board in Canada, be it in urban Canada or specific, also in rural Canada, large increased crime rates there. Uh, their response has been to table Bill C-75, which actually waters down penalties for, for serious major crime offenses. Uh, the, the government did not even address gang violence and any of its budgetary measures. Um, and, and we also have to realize that, uh, I mean, um, I'm a registered firearms owner and I understand that I'm subject to some of the most strict laws in, in, in the world. And, you know, I, I understand the gravity of my responsibility on handling and safe handling a firearm and we can't make legislation without remembering that there are also a large community of law-abiding firearms owners in Canada. I think that there's a lot of causes of, of gang violence that the government probably doesn't want to get into, uh, that is worthy of parliamentary study, um, but certainly it's, it's concerning to me that uh, um, you know, we're not even talking about how to prevent it and then how to, you know, ensure that those who are victims of these crimes have justice through, you know, strict strict sentencing. I'll say one last thing on this point. Um, I, you know, in, in my province of Alberta, I watched a alleged gang member, like gang leader, uh, walk free because uh, the Jordan principle was applied because there weren't enough judges that were appointed. So, like, there's just so many things that the government could be doing to set up a criminal justice system uh, but it, that, that supports the reduction of these incidences and instead I see the opposite. So I think we will have a conversation in the fullness of time but again I think we have to, uh, we do have to let uh, law enforcement officials undertake their investigation uh, at this time. Just one other quick question on immigration. Um, are either of you concerned about the government's pledge to bring in 50 white helmets from Syria and their families, given that there are questions about their allegiances? Um, you know, I, I would expect uh, with, with anyone entering the country that the government has undertaken a full screening, security screening, um, uh, and, and, and ensuring that, um, you know, proper process is applied. I, I, the government has made this announcement. I, I don't have a lot of details on, on exactly how it's being implemented. Uh, so, so I'd want to review that before commenting further. But, um, you know, to me, uh, the government needs to very clearly communicate uh, in any instance how they're ensuring that Canadians are safe, and, uh, but also that we prioritize uh, compassion in, 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 in our asylum and refugee system. So uh, I'll look forward to some more details, as, as often is the case with this uh, government on immigration. We frequently lack them um, and comment further after we receive that information. So this ends our press conference. Thank you everybody Thank you. for coming.